Long ago, you broke off your yoke and tore off your bondage. You said, I will not serve you in need no. <clears throat> on every high hill and under every spreading tree. You lay down as a prostitute, had planted you like a choice of vine of sound and reliable stock. Now then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine. Although you washed yourself with soap, and use an abundance of cleaning powder. The stain of your guilt is still before you, declares the Sovereign Lord. Go be it. I'm a little casual this morning. It's because I'm going to go to the community worship and I didn't want to take time to change and I got one little baby on one arm and one little baby on another arm and that's how our life story has been this week. I'm not complaining, I'm not looking for sympathy, but my wife and I's tails are dragging. She just fell asleep on my shoulder. I don't know if she heard me or not, but she started snoring. She's exhausted. I'm exhausted, but you know what? I'm always excited to tell you about Jesus Christ. It's what I live for. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This message is called No More Idols. Aren't you so glad that we don't have idols today in our lives? <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the prophets that have declared your word. But what we thank you for much more than that is your unfailing love to your people. Even those that you would call your enemies, that you would send your son to die for them. That while we were still enemies, Jesus Christ died for us. Lay down his life willingly. Nobody took it from him. He laid it down so that he could restore us back to a right relationship with you. Let us hear the words that you have to tell us today through your word. We thank you that your word is here today, that we have it in such an abundance. May we read it. May we be faithful to digest it. May we not live by meat or bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. May we apply it to our lives so that we are a light to this world. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So if you're keeping up with your Bible readings, you're reading in Jeremiah. You'll be reading in Jeremiah this week and everything. So that's why I wanted to play the uh, video, and there's also the drawing here if you haven't got that yet. Jeremiah had a message that the people didn't want to hear. They wanted to say, we don't have idols in our life. And you know, that's what we still say today. Nothing's changed. I don't even know what an asher or a pole is, right? Or even how to pronounce that. So how could I ever cut one down? <laughs> I Googled the other day just to see what the image was so I could get some images of it and everything. But they were all over the land where they went to these pagan temples. And as God says, they committed adultery. They were in the business of prostitution. Because see, what he's trying to tell us, trying to get to our heads, is that he created us to be in a loving, intimate relationship with Him. And He is a jealous God. And He will not stand for our love of idols. What's an idol? You don't have to go to a pagan place to worship. You don't have to have an Asher pole outside or anything else. What do you worship? If it was taken out of your life, could you live without it? What do you spend your time and energy on? What do you devote yourself more to than God? What do you put your trust in more than God? Your wealth? Your, your health? Your grandchildren? Your wife? Your job? 
What? Don't tell me you don't. Then you have idols. We all have idols. But it's so easy when we're reading that scripture to say, this isn't me. I don't have these idols in my life. I, I don't do these things. How could the Israelites do that? I challenge you to read Jeremiah and read it with the eyes of Christ and examine yourself and see how many idols that you do have in your life. In Jeremiah, the same verses that Merle read this morning, but from the message, it has a subtitle that says, Addicted to Alien Gods. Alien Gods. Well, we're aliens in this planet. This is not our home. Bonnie, I heard her say it today, said, told Al that he was young because in eternity, this is, wasn't even that. This is not our home. Our home is with God, our Creator, our Father, who loved us enough to restore us back to a right relationship with Him at the beating and death of His Son. That's what He did because He loved you so much. How is your love affair with Him? Do things get in the way? Or do you love Him with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength? As Jesus said, this is the greatest commandment. And then, as the words of the prophet say, do we love one another? Because we're all part of the family of God. Do we love even our enemies? Because we want to draw them to salvation and restoration. Get that enemy thing a little bit better when you do that, don't you? Because I am an enemy of the cross and sometimes I still live as an enemy of the cross. But in Jeremiah 2 from the message it says, A long time ago you broke out of the harness. You shook off all your restraints. You said, I will not serve. And you went, visiting every sex and religion shrine on the way like a common whore. I don't like thinking of myself that way. But when I sit and examine my heart, I know these words are true. You were a select vine, and I planted you from a completely reliable stock. And look how you've turned out a tangle, rancid growth, a poor excuse for a vine. These are God's words to His children. Scrub, using the strongest soap, scour your skin till it's raw. The sin grease will not come out. I can't stand to even look at you. This is God's decree, the Master's decree. This is written from your Creator, the one who loves you, who would give His Son's life for you. Because if you notice in the video, there's judgment, but there's also hope of future restoration. So again, I want to say, are you living that hope, fixing your eyes on Jesus, knowing that you have been cleansed from all of your unrighteousness, that there's not one blemish found in you if you put your faith and trust in Jesus? And that means that you're a disciple of His, that you follow after Him. You are a follower of Jesus. But guess what? Follower implies that you what? Follow! That you live as Jesus lived, not worrying about the cares of this world, knowing your Heavenly Father cares about you and will provide you for those things, so you don't put your trust and your hope in those things. You put your trust and hope in Jesus. Verses after that go on and say, How dare you tell me that I'm not stained by sin? I've never chased after Baal sex gods. We'll look, at the we'll look at the tracks you've left behind in the valley. How do you account for what is written in the desert dust? Tracks of camels in heat running this way and that. Tracks of wild donkey in rut. Sniffing the wind for the slightest scent of sex. How, who could possibly corral her? On the hunt for sex, sex, and more sex. Insatiable, indiscriminate, promiscuous. Wow. Now picture this, and maybe those words are a little too graphic, but if you've ever seen a dog in heat or a horse in heat, all that the mares, all the mares, all that the studs can do or anything is chase after them. They won't eat, they won't sleep, they won't drink, you can't do anything with them. They're on the hunt because they're obsessed with it. Right? I remember when I had, well, I've got one puppy now that's out of that litter, but he's an old dog. But, but before that, before he was born, his mother and father, I put them in separate kennels 
in the same garage. <laughs> that male dog would howl all night long. He would lose 10 pounds weight. He would rub himself raw on the fence going around in circles. And that's what God is comparing his children to. Even though we say, how dare you accuse me of that? But do we not chase after the things of this world? Do we not put our hope and trust in them? I think if anyone here would take even a glimpse of their heart, they would say, yes, I am guilty of that. God will judge us for every thought, word, and action. He gave His Son's life to restore us. How are you living? But I don't have to worry about idols, right? Whew! <laughs> I don't have any in my life. If you ask most Christians today about idols, they'll say that's something that's not there anymore. We don't have that problem anymore. We're living under grace. We are living under grace. So even more that we should live a righteous, holy life, knowing that we will stand account on that day, that Jesus will come with His reward and He will separate the sheep from the goats. Now let me remind you again, the sheep and the goats are in the same pasture. A goat thinks they're a sheep. They do the things a sheep do. But it doesn't change the fact that there are, they are a goat. And on that day, Jesus will separate the sheep from the goat. And He will also bring His reward for those sheep that, who have been faithful. So this is my story. This is my song. It's going to be praising my Savior all the day long. I long to hear that well done, my good and faithful servant. I long to sit at the feet of Jesus and just worship as Mary did, undistracted by anything else, just eating it all up how much God loved me that He would give His Son's own life for me. So maybe the Jeremiah video helped a little bit. Maybe you saw something there. Maybe it pricked something in your heart to say, I have idols in my life. From the Scripture when I read that about the vine, the scripture from this morning that Merle read, I was like, you know, that reminds me of that passage. So I want to go in that in John chapter 15. You won't find it in, in another gospel. You find it in John. It's part of his intimate talking with his disciples. He's already told them that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, there can't be a harvest. He's talking about himself laying down his life, but he's also talking about you and I following after him. And he says, if you're not willing to give up your life for me, then you won't gain anything. You will, in fact, lose everything. What does it profit a, whole, a man to, to give up, to, to chase after everything of this world and lose his own soul? To give up what really, really matters. And Jesus set the example in John chapter 13. He washed his feet of His disciples. His disciples, the ones that should have been washing His feet. A nasty, demeaning job, but Jesus our Lord did it and set that apart as an example for us to follow. And then in John chapter 14, He says, Don't worry, I'm not going to orphan you. I'm going away, but I'm going away to prepare a home for you, and I will send the Holy Spirit, and you will follow after Me if you yield to the Holy Spirit, and you really are My disciples. And in John chapter 15, we read these words, starting in verse 3. You are already clean. You don't have to worry about that sin stain anymore. Because of the, world I have, because of the word I have spoken to you. That what is what makes you clean. Then he says this, remain in me. Now notice you're going to see remain in me several more times. Are you doing that? As I also remain in you, because you can count on that. You don't have to worry about that. God is faithful. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Twice we've got to remain. Remain in me, remain in the vine, so that we can be a branch that produces fruit. What are we supposed to do? Produce fruit. Are we supposed to just be saved and go about our lives and not produce fruit? No. Are we supposed to go about our lives and read our Bible and pray, but not be a light to the world? No. We're supposed to produce fruit. That's what we're supposed to do. That's why we've been grafted into Jesus, into the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Third time we've got to remain in Jesus, to fix our eyes on Jesus. There's the problem, though. I don't do that all the time, do I? 
I get distracted by the cares of this world, by the things that I put my hope and my trust in. Verse 5, Jesus says, And I am the vine. Don't get distracted. You are the branches. Is this clear? If you remain in me. Fourth time. And I in you, because I can count on that. You will not just bear fruit. You will bear much fruit. So now examine yourselves and tell me if you're producing fruit. And if you are producing fruit, are you producing much fruit? When I go out and look at the vine of the blackberries, and one's got one or two, I say blackberries because I like blackberries. Kira calls them black strawberries because she can't say blackberry good. I don't know. <laughs> so she loves them. And Isaac loves them even more. He'll just gobble them down. They fight over them. Blackberries. I love blackberries. But if I go to the vine and it has some measly little berries on it or it doesn't have any berries, I don't care much for that vine, do I? In fact, sometimes I'm tempted to cut it down and plant something else in that soil, aren't I? But when they're luscious, big, juicy blackberries, and if you ever want to go pick some, maybe we'll plan a trip. We'll need to go down to Door Shack down there. There's some big, plump, juicy blackberries down there. It takes me a long time to pick a gallon because most of them go in here. But they're wonderful blackberries because those vines produce much fruit. And Jesus says, if you remain in me, you will produce much fruit. Not just bear fruit, but much fruit. Goes on to say, apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 6, if you do not remain in me, so we get it again, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Now, let me go back and tell you, this is Jesus talking to His disciples in the upper room. He's washed their feet. He's told them, I'm leaving, but I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. Greater things you will do than I do. Now, produce fruit. Produce much fruit. To do that, you've got to remain in Me. You can't be distracted by the things of this world. You cannot have idols in your life. You've got to remain in Me. Verse 7, if you remain in me, there we go again, and my words remain in you, so you've got to be reading this and apply it, living off this, not living off of food, okay? Then ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Wow. There's the promises again that we don't even need from God, the blessings that come instead of the cursings because we simply do what we're supposed to do. A vine is supposed to produce fruit. That's what we're made for. But if I do that, then ask whatever I wish, and it will be given to you. Wow. Verse 8, this is to my Father's glory. Jesus taught us how to pray. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, glorified, because that's what I want to do with my life. Not my will, but yours. This is to my Father's glory that what? You bear not just fruit, but much fruit. That's what Jesus wants from His disciples that truly love Him, His faithful servants. And He ends it by saying, this is showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the proof of the pudding. You go to the blackberry vine and it's got a lot of plump blackberries on it. And the one who sowed the vine in the first place enjoys picking those beautiful, plump blackberries. He's pleased with that vine. You have no fear that he'll ever cut the vine down and throw it into the fire. Instead, he, you get to see the farmer come out and be excited and happy with what the vine is producing, enjoying the fruit. This is my story. This is my song. What about your life? Is it praising your Savior all the day long? But thank goodness we don't have any idols, right? <laughs> no more idols. We don't have them today. Do we? Well, if you look at the little thing, that's, you've got the little alarm clock of, of Jeremiah standing on the desk and all these other things. And I'm thinking, you know, how many idols do we have and how many warning alarms are going off every single day that we don't hear? And we get distracted further and further and further and deeper and deeper and deeper into that sin, into that rut. Where then we sit there and say, I'm fine, I'm saved, I don't have anything to worry about. This will all be okay. 
And we get further and further away from where we should be. How could Israel ever get to the point where they're at? How could they see it time and time again God putting His firm hand down on them, hearing the prophet's words, and continue to be blind? Well, I'll tell you one way. Remember back in Exodus when Pharaoh hardened his heart against God? If you read later, it says God hardened his heart because he hardened his first. You might not understand that. You might not think that's fair, but God knows everything. He is completely sovereign again, and he will use you to bring him glory one way or the other. But there's a time, just like with Judas, when there wasn't any turning anymore. When you see the warning signs and the alarms going off, turn. Turn your eyes back to Jesus. Get rid of those idols. Produce fruit. Love Him. Don't worry about the things of this world because, again, God takes care of the sparrows. He feeds them. How much more is He going to take care of you? No matter what you think your circumstances are. So let's move 700 years forward. We went backwards first to, to Exodus. Now let's move 700 years forward to Paul. Let's see what Luke writes about Paul in Acts 17. Verse 24, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And He is not served by human hands as, as if He needs anything. Rather, He Himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Let me read that one again. He Himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else else? Are you thankful? Are you thanking Him for it? Are you distressed? Do you have your hope and faith put in Him instead of in idols? Verse 26, from one man He made all the nations and they, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And He marked out their appointed times in history from the Pharaoh to the Allen, okay, and the boundaries of their land. God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him. The fact that we can reach out to God and find Him is amazing. Talking about His character and everything, not about us, but about God is that loving and kind and approachable that by faith we can be restored. Not by any works of righteousness, but by faith in Jesus Christ can we be completely restored to Him. Though He is not far from any one of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. Everything that we are is because God gave it to us. For, we, for in Him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stones, an image made by human design and skill. He is so much more. He's not any of these things that we build our castles on sinking sand. We can firmly put our faith and trust in Him. Verse 30, In the past God overlooked such ignorance. And it's hard to say that He did reading Jeremiah, but look, this is what Luke is saying now. If you think he put up with it then, what is he going to do now that he sacrificed his only son? I certainly wouldn't put up with as much. He has cleansed you with the blood of Jesus Christ. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to do what? To repent, to change their mind, to change their heart to change the way they live so that they realize they are a vine that is supposed to produce fruit. So they realize it's not my will, but His. So that they realize it's not my life, but the life He has given me to serve Him. So that, he real, that I realize it's not by my works, but by His grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. And that I should live every moment I can fixing my eyes on Jesus and living a life that brings glory and honor to God the Father. Verse 31. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. It reminds me of Lee Strobal, the movie, if you haven't seen that one, where he went out and said, you know, if, if I can disprove the resurrection... 
then I can bring down this Christianity thing. It's all a house, a house built of cards that will fold. But he could not disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's no body. There's an empty tomb. No one ever found it. No one ever has any answers for it. History tells us that, that Jesus, they saw a risen Jesus. Oh, maybe the Romans didn't kill him. Uh-huh. You go ahead and you think whatever. I know that Jesus Christ raised from the dead and my hope is built on that and nothing less. God's Son died for me and I can put my faith and trust confidently and securely in Him for all eternity. Wow. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. What a gracious God. Why would I not want to try to live for Him? Those are Luke's words about Paul. Okay, so let's read what Paul wrote. He wrote this to the church in Romans. Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We know what happened. Saul became Paul and he never looked back. All the things that he thought meant something before now were meaningless to him. And he could do all things through Christ who gave him strength. He could have peace even when he was in jail in fear of his life and write some of the words that we have today because God uses even those perilous times to bring him glory. So he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written from the Old Testament, the righteous will live by faith. You can't say you're a follower of Jesus and not follow Jesus. It doesn't work that way. You can't say you have faith and put your hope and confidence in idols. Okay? Verse 18, the wrath of God. There we're back to that again. We keep going back to that. There's obedience and there's disobedience. There's blessings and cursings. There is going to be judgment and there will be wrath. There's also going to be judgment and there will be reward. Decide which one you're going to say, as Joshua said. But as for me and my Lord, <laughs> and me and my children, we, our house, we will serve the Lord. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal powers and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse, no excuse whatsoever. For although they knew God, yep, I know God, I know He exists, that doesn't get you into heaven. That's not faith. Faith is that you put your trust and hope in Him. You live your life for Him. Not that you just acknowledge that He exists. What verse am I on? What number? Sorry. Thank you. I'll find it here. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. See, there's a difference. I can say I know God all day long, but when I look at my life, does my light shine? Am I producing fruit? Am I loving even my enemy? Am I forgiving those the way I would want God to forgive me? Oh, maybe I hit home with that last one because <laughs> maybe I got that grudge against that person that I don't like. Why has that one got to be in there? Have you noticed when you're reading those lists too, there's children that didn't obey their parents and there's all these other things? Oh, how about when Jesus was asked? You know, what about, you've heard it said that y'all shall not commit murder. But if you've had hatred in your heart towards a brother, you're guilty of it. Wow. I've got a lot to change in my life. And it takes every day getting up and giving God thanks and glorifying Him for what a wretched sinner I am, but He loved me enough to send His Son to die for me. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave Him thanks, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And I said, I don't have idols in my life. <laughs> Verse 22, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools 
and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, for idols. Again, I'm going to use myself instead of you. I don't point fingers. I'll point them here. How many times in my life have I put my faith in my work, my health, my children, even the weather? <laughs> We, we, we did a community worship on August 11th. Who would ever think it's 65 and raining? <laughs> but we're still going to worship God. We'll go indoors instead of outside. We'll worship Him and praise Him and give Him thanks because He is the one who gave us this day. This is the day the Lord hath given us and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I won't exchange it for an image of Him. Made... To look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, because they did this, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. I don't like thinking of it that way, though. I don't ever think that I'm worshiping Him. But if you're putting your trust in something other than the Lord, He's jealous. He calls it worship. He calls it idolatry. He calls it prostitution. He calls it whoredom. And when I think about it that way, whenever my spouse, and I'm sure she thinks about it back the other way, when other things are absorbing the time she should be giving me, the love that she should be giving me, the affection she should be giving me, I get jealous. Why would God not, not be jealous of our love for Him when we let other things distract us from loving Him and thanking Him and giving Him praise? Paul goes on towards the end of that chapter and says in verse 32, Although they, knew, the, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Jesus said it this way. He said, you're either for me or against me. You're either gathering sheep into the fold or you're scattering. You can't do both. It is black or white. It's not gray. It's either you're for Jesus or you're against Jesus. Paul also, Paul also wrote a couple other things that I want to mention to you. He wrote a letter to this church called the Corinthians, another church. And he said this in chapter 10, verse 6, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. That's why when we read this, that it penetrates our heart, our soul, and our mind. And at first we might say, Ah, oh, I'm not guilty of these things, but as we really examine it, we get on our knees and thank God for His forgiveness, for His faithfulness, because I have done these things. I have prostituted myself out to foreign gods. Verse 7, do not be what? Idolaters. <laughs> don't be what? That's something I don't like calling myself, but he says don't do that. As some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revel revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as they did. And let me remind you of Jesus' words again. If you've had lust in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. Yes, I have had lust for things, created things, whatever they are. Yes, I have. Yes, I will still as long as I breathe. But when I do, I'll be like David who lusted. And I'll say, Lord, at least this is what I hope with the power of the Holy Spirit. Examine my heart. Please forgive me. Against you and only you have I sinned. Put me back into a right relationship with you. And as I read His Word and absorb it in everything, the more and more that I hope to become like Christ and the more that I hope that lust is as foreign to me as a foreign Asher pole. I don't even know what it is. Don't be idolaters as some of them were. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in reverie. We should not commit sexual immorality as they did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. That's the judgment we read about. We should not test Christ. Wait a minute. Christ wasn't even here in that Old Testament example when they were in the wilderness. Was He? Yeah. Everything points to Jesus Christ. We should not test Christ because He lives in us now through the Holy Spirit as some of them did. And another example, they were killed by snakes. 
and do not grumble. Wait a minute, why is that one put in here? There's one of those that I'm telling you that just gets in here like, because I know I've grumbled. Now I can do this. <laughs> I can honestly do it. We've all grumbled. Do not grumble as some of them did. Okay, well, what happened then? What, let's see. They were killed by a destroying angel. I don't want to grumble. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. One more letter that Paul wrote was to another church called Colossae. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Here's a question I'm going to ask you. Is, does this apply to you? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know Him as your Lord? Since then you have been raised with Christ. That means the grave has no power over you. You will not see the torments of hell. You will never be separated from eternal life in the eternal presence of the God who loved and created you. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. First was set your hearts. Now set your mind on things above. Here we go. Not on earthly things. Let's put idols in there. For you died that old life. Jesus said in John 3 before we got to verse 16 when Nicodemus came and had all the answers and thought there were no idols in his life, Jesus said, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God, let alone enter into it. But if you're born again, all that has died, it's gone. You will do greater things because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You are now the temple where God resides and there's not room for another lover in there. None. No more room. Jesus only. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, that day of judgment, also will appear, you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, I'm all right with that one, impurity, yeah, lust, yeah, I'm all right, evil desires, and greed. Wait a minute, let me re-examine myself. <laughs> maybe I'm guilty of most all of those. Uh, maybe I'm guilty of all of those if I really want to examine. What's the word next thing say? Which is idolatry. There's your definition. Oh, I can't go back anymore because I've just heard it from God's Word and say, I don't have idols. Those idol things, that's a thing of the past. I don't have idols in my life. Uh, sexual immorality, if you thought an impure thought in your heart. Impurity. Lust, if you've ever desired something that your neighbor had, that covetousness, that tenth commandment. Well, I couldn't have stopped at nine. I might have could have checked them off again. No, I couldn't. I couldn't check off the one. Okay? Evil desires. Oh, when that neighbor did something to me and I thought back, or that car cut me off and about ran me in the ditch, and I had that thought. Okay. And greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, because of this, these sinful things that are in your life, these idols, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, right? Okay. In the life you once lived, the life that's dead and gone. But now you must also, oh, there's more. <laughs> Rid yourselves of all such things as these. Okay, maybe I did good on the first list. Let me see now. Anger, oh. <laughs> I blew it already. Rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. I blew it. You're right. It says I need to get rid of these also. Why did Paul have to write these down? Because God told him to. This is God's standard. And we all have failed because we don't reach God's righteous standard. We've all sinned and fall short of His glorious standard. 
but the gift of God, there's the but in there, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he adds more. Do not lie to each other. I thought he was done. Oh, yeah, I'm guilty there. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on new self. That's right. I've got to remember this. I'm a new creation in Christ, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of the Creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, that's who you are, holy and dearly love, clothe yourself with these things instead. So now we've got even more to add to the list. I should be doing these things after I get rid of those other things. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience even. Woo! Verse 13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. There you go again. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, if you hadn't figured it out yet, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, you do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Maybe you don't have idols in your life. But as you read through Jeremiah, and I trust that you are reading through Jeremiah, examine your hearts, examine your minds. Ask God to point out idols in your life so you can cut them down and destroy them so they don't hinder you from living a life of worth. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. We thank you that you created us, that you love us, that you've empowered us by your Spirit, that these things don't have any power over us if we'll just let them go. Satan has no dominion or authority in our lives. We serve a risen Savior and Lord, and His name is Jesus Christ. We thank You and praise You. We give You all glory and honor. Fully equip Your children as they die to themselves to live for You. Not for our will, Father, but for Yours. Thank You for this church. Thank You for each and every one that's here. We just pray these things in Jesus' name.